Dr. Notour is a postdoctoral researcher with the Division of Vascular Surgery at Henry Ford, and he's going to talk about lower extremity bypass. Dr. Natur. Hello. Hi, everyone. Um, so, yeah, I'm the research fellow. Today, I'll be talking about lower extremity bypass. We have no disclosures. So, lower extremity bypass involves suturing a vascular conduit from a site proximal to the level of an arterial obstruction to a distal site of an uninvolved artery, as you can see in the illustration on the left. Uh, pre op vascular imaging identifies the location of obstruction and proposed distal targets along with the preferred conduit. It's very important to run a pre op medical risk assessment um, uh, to identify the comorbidities and try to optimize the patient whenever possible, except obviously in emergencies. And outcomes are affected by pre op comorbidities, and thus these are important to document in order to compare patients. As for the indications, first one obviously is peripheral artery disease. It's increasingly common as the population age with an estimation of 15% of individuals being affected with an age more than 70 years old. It often coexists with coronary and carotid artery disease and has a poor overall prognosis with a mortality rate of around 20 to 30% at five years. As you can see on the Kaplomere survival curve on the last around 10 years, 40% of PLD patients are dead. Claudicans are patients who experience um, pain upon exertion, secondary to reduce blood flow to the leg, secondary to PAD. Intervention is in indicated only if it contributes to a significant reduction in quality of life, and around 10 to 15% of claudicans will progress to chronic limb threatening ischemia or, or CLTI, which often mandates intervention. So CLTI is a clinical syndrome defined by the presence of CAD in combination with rest pain, gangrene, or lower limb ulceration for more than two week duration. The estimated one year limb loss for CLTI patients is around 15 to 20%, and it often mandates intervention. Other indications include femoral or popliteal aneurysms, as you can see in the first picture in the top. Um, other include arterial thromboembolism or dissection, uh, popliteal artery and trapin syndrome, various forms of inflammatory arthritis, soft tissue sarcomas with vascular encasement and arterial injury, which might be blunt or penetrating. When we go for the medical risk assessment, it's again very important to assess uh, the comorbidities because PAD patients usually have a lot of comorbidities such as diabetes, hypertension, and TKD. It's important to risk stratify the patients and try to optimize um, the patient if, it's, if time permits. Uh, it's important to try to advise, to advise smoking cessation because it has been shown that patients who smoke have decreased graft patency with time. So as for the vascular evaluation, all patients undergo segmental arterial pressures along with the ankle breaker, ankle breaker indices, as you can see in the illustration on the left. Uh, it helps us document the extent, severity, and location of the occlusive disease, and also serves as a baseline for future comparisons. Vein mapping is equally important, help us in determining the patency, diameter, and length of the autogenous conduit to be used. The ideal conduit is the epsilateral great saphenous vein. The alternatives include the contralateral one, small saphenous vein, or arm veins, and sometimes multiple vein segments could be used. This is a nice segue to uh, a recent uh, study that we performed using the Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan Cardiovascular Consortium, or the BM squared VIC, where we showed that only 45% of physicians performed crop vein mapping before bypass surgery as compared to 68%. Uh, in the National Vascular Quality Initiative Registry. We showed that patients who underwent vein mapping were more than twice as likely to have a venous conduit used, 69% versus 28%. Patients who did not undergo vein mapping were more than twice as likely to have a prosthetic graft used, 72% versus 31%. We also showed that patients who did not undergo vein mapping had a higher intraoperative blood loss, stayed longer in the hospital postoperatively, and required more blood transfusions at 30 days. As for the inflow, inflow vessels, traditionally the femoral artery has been used. However, other vessels such as the superficial femoral or popliteal arteries could also be used and they have been proven to be reliable and often preferred as they shorten the length of the conduit. As for the arc flow vessels, um, the fem femoral popliteal bypass is usually chosen when the above or below the knee popliteal artery is patent. 
and there is at least a single tibial artery that's patent and minimally diseased to the level of the foot. Femoral tibial bypass is usually, is usually chosen in the presence of a significantly diseased or occluded popliteal artery, or if the proximal tibial vessels demonstrate significant stenosis or occlusion. In general, for popliteal bypass, the outflow is usually based on angiographic appearance, the most robust distal vessel with direct flow to the foot being preferably chosen. For the conduit selection, the great toughness vein is the most commonly used, best performing in terms of long-term patency and limb salvage rate. It could be used at three configurations, as illustrated in the, in the left pictures, uh, reversed, in situ, or non-reversed. Now, each configuration has its own advantages and drawbacks. But however, the long-term patency and limb salvage rate have been shown to be similar. Hence, the choice is largely a matter of surgeon preference combined with anatomy. However, up to 40% of patients might not have a suitable great toughness vein, or the great toughness vein might have been used for, um, for cabbage, for example. So alternate source of veins include the small toughness vein, upper extremity cephalic or basilic vein, and super superficial femoral vein. Now, these veins are more commonly used as reverse to avoid potential injury due to their thinner walls while performing valvulotomy. Occasionally, multiple venous segments can be Slice together to create a bypass, bypass conduit of appropriate length. However, these grafts have a higher rate of reintervention with inferior durability. The most common prosthetic graft used is the polytetrafluoroethylene or the PTFE graft. Um, it has been shown to have acceptable midterm patency for the above the knee bypasses. However, it compares poorly to autogenous veins for the below the knee bypasses. Some so heparin bonding, addition of external rings, use of vein patch or cuff, and distal AV fistula have been used to improve patency of prosthetic grafts. Most commonly used one is the vein cuff, which is, as you can see in the illustration, it's, it's, a, it's a vein that links the prosthetic graft with the outflow artery. It's, uh, it's usually used for small or thickened peripheral artery, and it has been shown uh, to improve the primary graft patency with lower intervention rates. Comparing the primary patency for the um, great saphenous vein versus the PTFE prosthetic graft, uh, and starting with the femoral popliteal bypass for the above the knee position, as you can see, the one year patency is 86% for the saphenous vein versus 80% for the PTFE. At five years, 75 versus 53, and at 10 plus years, it's 44 versus 32. When going below the knee, the difference become, becomes more more seen, for example, the saphenous vein at one year it has a primary patency of 86% versus 74 for the PTFE. At five years, 71 versus 44, and 10 plus years is 53 versus only 29%. For overall uh, infrapopulatal bypass, bypass for all sources of inflow, the PTFE prosthetic graph performs poorly with a 60% uh, primary patency at one year versus 82% for the great saphenous vein. And at five, five years, it's only 24% versus around 70% for the great saphenous vein, which kind of explain one of the main reasons why the prosthetic graft is only used for, is preferably used for the above, above the position. This is a, a summary of the general conduct of the operation. We usually start with the arterial exposure, and then we expose the vein, we harvest the vein, we systemically anti anticoag the patient. We perform the proximal anastomosis, tunnel the graft, and then perform the distal anastomosis. And finally, we perform completion imaging, which could be either be using uh, duplex ultrasonography or angiography uh, to look for any technical problem. Moving on for the post-operative care, starting with antithrombotics. So, so multidisciplinary guidelines recommend long-term antiplatelet therapy with aspirin or clopidogrel for all patients with PAD. Our limited data is present uh, on the impact of dual antiplatelet for graft failure prevention. Uh, in a subgroup analysis in recent CASPER trial for prosthetic graft, clopidogrel plus aspirin significantly reduced graft occlusion compared with aspirin alone. However, this was not replicated for the vein, the vein graft. Anticoagulants are not routinely prescribed after lower extremity bypass uh, due to the high risk of bleeding. However, it might be considered in patients with high risk uh, for graft thrombosis, such as patients who receive spliced vein conduit 
patients with poor runoff postoperatively or patients who have PTFE graft. Do not bleeding complications are consistently increased in patients receiving anticoagulants. Statin therapy is indicated for all PAD patients, irrespective of their baseline LDL. Uh, it has been shown to improve graft patency with lower major adverse limb events and long term mortality. This graph illustrates that shows that patients who take both aspirin and statin have around 18% absolute improvement in five year survival as compared to patients who take none. As for the graft surveillance, uh, at six weeks postoperatively, ABIs and graft duplex ultrasonography are typically done to, to uh, assess the adequacy of revascularization and establish a baseline reference. Uh, at follow up for vein grafts, ABIs and duplex ultrasonography are usually performed every three months for two years and then every six to 12 months thereafter. However, to note, vein graft stenosis de develops in around 20 to 30% of infraingual vein bypass during the first year. For prostatic grafts, no specific recommendation exists regarding surveillance because no direct benefit has been shown from performing prosthetic graft surveillance in, for, in terms of long-term patency. Moving on for the complications, general complications are related to the comorbidities that are uh, usually present in PAD patients. So number of general post-operative problems include myocardial infarction, arrhythmias, or sudden cardiac death, pneumonia, um, acute respiratory distress syndrome, DVT, pulmonary embolism, acute kidney injury, or nerve injuries. This underlies the importance of pre-op medical optimization whenever time permits. The most common local complications include graft thrombosis and graft infection, which is most commonly used in, in patients who receive prosthetic grafts. Bleeding is very common. Surgical site infections are seen in up to 11% of cases at 30 days, regardless of the bypass origin. And other potential wound complications include hematoma formation and wound dehesis. In terms of major complications, the major amputation rate is estimated to be around 4% at 30 days and 18% at one year. Mortality is estimated to be around 3% at 30 days and 19% at one year. And the major adverse card cardiac events is estimated to be around 5% at 30 days. Thank you everyone for listening and happy to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Natur. Um, I have a question. Um, your, you had, your slide said that um, when patients are taking aspirin and a statin together after their bypass, uh, they have good results. And, um, and we, do, we know that pa patients who continue to smoke at their bypass, uh, they, they, their bypasses usually get occluded because of smoking. So does this data include the aspirin and statin data? Does this include patients who smoke or is this non-smokers only? I think the, the paper included patients who smoke. Okay. And that yeah. would be probably be the same for the major morbidities. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, did the paper say like what, uh, how much of an increase that smokers uh, no, they, are they did not, risk? No, they did not perform some analysis for smoking. Okay. That would be interesting yeah. though, to yeah. compare the smokers to the non-smokers and the major morbidities. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Well, maybe BMC2 can do that. <laughs> we could do that for sure. <laughs> yes, that's that's true. Next paper. Yeah. Yep. All right. 